Look at how beautiful and foggy and wet this river looks. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. To the church in Laodicea. Laodicea. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write... These are the words of the Amen, A-M-E-N, capital A. The faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. That's the Son of Man, the Son of God. That's your King. These are the words of the Amen. The Amen. So when you say your prayers and then you say, you know, in the name of Jesus, amen. I don't know if you say it that way. That's how I say it. These are the words of the amen. Amen describes it's a name for Jesus. I mean, I'm sure someone would disagree with me. These are the words of the Amen. The faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Who's talking to us here? Jesus Christ. Who's giving John this revelation to write down? Jesus Christ. And he says his name is Amen. One of his names, he has many names, many wonderful, beautiful names. His name is Amen. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. Wow. Uh-oh. This church is going to get it. I wish you were either one or the other, cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Wow. So these people are very rich to the world. They are rich in the eyes of God. If you won the lottery tomorrow, if you won the lottery tomorrow, how long would it take you to turn to the money and turn away from Jesus Christ? You know, and our pride, our pride says, oh, no, 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 I would never do that. No, you would. You most likely would. Most people would. If you won the billion-dollar jackpot tonight at the lottery, the Powerball, one and a half billion dollars, I guarantee it would take you away from Jesus Christ immediately. What is he saying here? These people are rich in Laodicea. They're rich. They're wealthy. And what is Jesus' description of these rich, wealthy people with lots of good deeds? He's, now, most people don't understand what this means. You're neither cold nor hot. You're lukewarm. In another place in the Bible, it says the same verse that Jesus is going to spew you, vomit you out of his mouth. Have you ever had lukewarm soup? It's horrible. <laughs> you can have the best soup, the best stew. And when I mean lukewarm, I mean like 70 degrees, you know. Some old leftover 70 degree soup 
But you got to be careful. If it's 70 degrees, you might get food poisoning. But there's nothing better than a hot steaming soup or stew. Hot potato soup. You can see the steam coming off this beef stew with all the vegetables. There's nothing better than a hot, you know, hot apple pie right out of the oven. And also, if you have leftovers out of the refrigerator, and sometimes you don't have time to heat them up at all, you just eat it cold, and that stuff tastes good too, like um, leftover cold pizza the next day. Or some beef stew, you just stir it up and eat it cold if you're in a hurry. But there's nothing worse than lukewarm in-between food. It's not hot. It's not satisfying. It's not fresh. And it's not cold to where at least you can taste it cold and it's good. It's lukewarm. Let me give you another example. So let's say you're in Phoenix, Arizona, and it's 114 degrees outside. And you're one of these guys out there digging a ditch. And you ask someone for a drink of water. And they come over and they hand you some lukewarm water to drink. <laughs> Wouldn't you rather have ice cold water or some steamy hot tea would actually, some hot coffee would actually be better than some lukewarm old bad coffee that you bought six hours ago? You know what um, one of the number one items that sells at a grocery store? Bags of ice. Bags of ice, man, I wish I'd invented that company. The bag of ice, guys. They got a factory that makes bags of ice. They fill up a, a box truck and drive around and fill up the ice things. They make millions of dollars every year. Selling frozen water. Selling frozen water. Nationwide, it's a billion-dollar industry selling frozen water. In a bag. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. What do you do? What do you do with lukewarm bad food? Don't you just like take a bite and then you throw it in the garbage? Like, ugh. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. You ever see people just at your church give like a $20 bill in the offering? You know, God doesn't need your money. That may be a shock to you. And you might say, you might be a smart aleck and say, well, good, then I'll keep it. Well, that would be fine with God because he doesn't want your money because you're so greedy you don't want to give him the money. You're begrudgingly giving him that $20. There's very few generous people left on earth. I said if I um if the world starts to financially collapse over the next four or five years, three years. I'm going to make big, huge pots of um, potato and beef soup and homemade bread at my house, and I'm going to drive around and feed people. I'll buy a van or something. I'll, I'll drive around, and I'll keep it. And I won't give them some old stuff. No, I'll keep it nice and fresh and hot. I'll have it all set up. I know how to do all that. There's nothing worse than... Someone who caters a party, like you're having a Christmas party, for example, and your boss, you know. Well, back in the day, they would have a caterer come to the Christmas party because back then, it was part of your bonus for your boss or the owner to throw a Christmas party. I 
used to live in a completely different world, my friends. And those of you who are over 50, you did too. I was born in 1962. I'm 61 years old. I grew up in a world where you can buy a $30,000 house downtown. You could buy a car with only 40,000 miles on it for about $2,000 max. It was almost brand new. You'd get convertibles for that. A pair of pants was $6. A hamburger, fries, and a drink was $2.99 or $2.49. Look at that boat out there. Good day to be in a cabin cruiser. Have a cabin so you can keep the rain off you. Well, at the Christmas party, you would show up at the Christmas party. It was required, and the boss would walk around, the owner would walk around with your bonus checks. And hand them out at the Christmas party. That's where you got your bonus check. You didn't mail it to you. When I was um, 18 years old, I was making $12 an hour, 45 hours a week with overtime. The, um, the health insurance was free. You just had to fill out the paperwork. It's a true story. 100% free, no deductible. You go to the doctor, it was only $32, you know, $26. <laughs> you get a prescription, it was $12. So the boss would have the food catered. And depending on the cater, you know, sometimes they'd show up two or three hours early and that food was cold and lukewarm. I'm using this example. Everything was going great. The food may have been great. Did you ever have someone bring you a Subway sandwich from Subway? Those sandwiches are fantastic when they're fresh. But they bring you a sandwich, you go home, two hours later, you got this lukewarm, kind of blah, wilted sandwich. It's lost its crispiness. Jesus says in another part of the Bible, because you are lukewarm, I will spew you. I will vomit you out of my mouth. He says, I wish you were hot or cold so I could do something with you. You know, Jesus is, admit, is admitting he can't do anything with lukewarm Christians. Now me, when I first heard that years ago, I said, well, that doesn't make any sense. I'd rather be lukewarm than ice cold. At least you got some kind of fire going. That's not how Jesus thinks. He would rather have you hot on fire in the spirit or completely cold in the spirit, that means you've never believed. That means you still have a chance to believe and become burning hot. But you want to know what a lukewarm Christian is? 70% of the American church today. And that's not funny. I don't say that lightly. I do not say that lightly. That is scary and sad and um, despicable. A lukewarm Christian is a believer who stopped doing the work of um, the Spirit, the work of Christianity, but it sounds better to say the work of the Spirit. A lukewarm believer is someone who stops doing the work of the Spirit. Do you believe in Jesus? Yeah. Yeah, I do believe in Jesus. Oh, yeah, what's that like? Uh, what do you mean, what's it like? Well, aren't there requirements and stuff? Well, do you go to church? Ah, uh, well, once in a while. Christmas and um, Easter. What, do you come from a Christian family? Oh, yeah, my, my mother, she's on fire for Jesus. She's so annoying. Every time she talks, it's about praise Jesus, praise Jesus. But I don't know. I mean, I believe in Jesus. I'm saved. I, I've never read the Bible. I 
don't I don't really practice it if that's what you're saying. What kind of a paycheck would you receive if you were a lukewarm employee? Do you think your boss would keep you around? Do you ever see an ad in the paper now hiring lukewarm employees? <laughs> You ever see an ad in the paper? Now hiring. Help one. Lukewarm employees. We want dull, boring employees who will do just the minimum standards. Take your check. Go home and stay work here for 35 years. Just lukewarm employees that are almost worthless. But you get just enough done every day to, to survive. Okay, let's say you got a 401k or any kind of investments and you go down to your investment advisor, right? And you say, so um, I'm going to give you all my money. That's a pretty scary statement right there. I'm going to give you all my money and I want you to um, make me as much profit as possible. And then the guy says, yeah, we're going to make you some lukewarm um, profits, returns. You say, what? Yeah, yeah, we don't go for the big stuff here at ABC Investing Accounting. We're just going to have some lukewarm returns. We'll get you 1%, 1.5%. Last year, we got a guy 2% return on his investment. And you say to the um person, well, how much do you charge? They say, oh, 2.5%. You're actually going to lose money every year coming to us. Would you stay with a lukewarm investment advisor? If you went to the doctor, see, I'm sticking up for Jesus here. Why Jesus hates lukewarm Christians, I will put it that way. If you went to the doctor and you got a bad uh, report and you needed a surgery or something, would you want a lukewarm surgeon? <laughs> Would you want your doctor to be lukewarm? Let's say it's nothing bad. You're having a baby. Do you want a guy who, who delivers babies? Kind of, He's a lukewarm baby delivery, you know, doctor. Like, oh, yeah, another lady having another baby. I'll get to you. Have you ever heard a business advertise? Come on down and shop at our um, store because we sell lukewarm deals on carpeting. We're just kind of average and blah, 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 you know. If you're tired of those real exciting carpet stores <laughs> who have all the low prices, just come to <laughs> just come to our Luke. You ever buy a car um, and, you know, this is true. I'm not making stuff. The salesman comes out and he acts like he doesn't want to be there. Like, hi, can I help you? You're like, yeah, I'm looking to give you like $68,000 for a brand new car today. He's like, yeah. Well, what, what kind of, what did you have in mind? You know, you go... I'll tell you who's lukewarm today. Every cashier in the United States of America. You walk up to the cash cashiers and they're like, how are you? Did you find everything you were looking for? <laughs> so listen to what Jesus is saying here. I think I've given you enough lukewarm examples. Let me give you one more, and I'm not trying to get into your personal life, and I'm not trying to sound foul-minded. This is straight up to my married friends. Do you want your spouse to be a lukewarm um, person in the bedroom? Now, I'm not trying to get weird or anything. I'm saying, if someone asked your wife, if you were the husband standing there, right? I'll pick on the husbands only. And your wife's standing there with two of his girl, her girlfriends, and one of them says to your wife, what's your husband like in the bedroom? Do you want your wife to say, oh, he's lukewarm? You know, he's lukewarm, blah, 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 lukewarm. He's a lukewarm guy. 
You know what I'm saying? Do you want to hire a lukewarm plumber to come over to your house? You're like, I got a leak in my faucet. And the plumber comes over and leaves, charges you $350, and now you have two leaks in your faucet. <laughs> not only did he not fix the first leak, he caused another one. Do you, in your standards, in your life, I bet you do not allow lukewarm things around you. Hey, I went through the drive-thru and I ordered four sandwiches and we only got two sandwiches and half our order. Well, that's okay. We're not going to say anything. No, you'd go right in there and say, hey, you forgot half my order. So you personally, your standards are really high when it comes to the world. See, because most of the world's two-faced. Do you want Jesus to be lukewarm Savior? Hey, Jesus, am I going to be saved? Ah, Jesus says, um, uh, maybe. I mean, what, what have you been up to so far? Um, let me see. Uh, and then... He's like, yeah, I guess, I guess. I'll, I'll put your name on the list. You go back 10 years later, say, hey, Jesus, remember me? You said I, I received salvation 10 years ago. And Jesus lukewarmly says to you, now, who are you again? See, if these are the standards you require, why are you surprised when Jesus is requiring the exact same standard? From you. And then, you know, the Bible says the um, the way you put out is what you'll receive. The measure you use, the measure you use will be measured back to you. I said to someone recently, they said, I need to make more money. And I said, hey, that place you work at is hiring for an assistant manager. And it pays $6 an hour more. It's a true story. It's at a huge grocery store. And they go, oh, yeah, I don't want to do that, man. But you want more money. They're like, yeah, I, I'd like the $6 an hour, but I, I don't want to, um, you know, be the manager. I said, you're not the manager, you're just the assistant manager. They only work 45 hours a week and... Yeah, but, you know, I don't know. I don't think it's worth They're lukewarm. They don't have enough money. I say, well, the only other way to get money is to cut back on all your expenses, and then you'll have more money with what you have now. They said, well, I don't really want to do that either. I said, well, you're just young and immature, and you're, you haven't learned yet, I guess. So just keep walking to work in your lukewarm lifestyle. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness. The ruler of God's creation, I know your deeds that you are neither hot, cold, nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Why should Jesus have lower standards than you have for him or the rest of the world. You you demand high standards from God, right? I hope you do. It doesn't matter if you do or not. God has high standards, but don't you demand God's best? Well, why do you then turn around and give God less than your best? Question mark. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. Jesus said, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. The man who had the, um, the parable, the man who, he had so much abundance in crops that year that he didn't have enough barns to hold all of his wheat. And back then, wheat meant wealth, a lot of wealth, you know. 
This man had triple, quadruple crops that year. So what he said to himself was, like they're saying here, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm bloody rich, I'm so rich, I don't need anything. What about your health? Do you want to be um, rich and sick? No, that doesn't sound like fun. You want to be rich and in the hospital? No. You're bloody rich. Do you want God to take your life tonight? No, my riches will not help there either. The Egyptians were so rich, they were so blinded in the pyramids, they, they buried themselves with wealth, all their riches. They were convinced that they could take it to the next world. Well, without Jesus, they're in hell now. It's starting to get windy down here. I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich. I don't need anything. Well, I've asked the question of people, well, how will, get your soul, how will you get your soul into heaven? So this man said, I'm going to build, I'm going to tear down all my old barns and build brand new ones. Because back then, barns did not have like um, dehumidifiers and electric fans and all this stuff to keep them dry. So... You kind of had to be careful in the old days. You know, you, you couldn't keep the crop in a barn too long. It would start to get moldy and mildewy. The man said, "I'm," and he said something that made God so angry. He said, I'm going to build all new barns, put all my riches and crops in the barns and I'm going to sit back for a few years and take it easy in life. Now, what the man basically looked at the, the face of God like some idiot and said, I know you just gave me quadruple profits, but Lord, I'm going to go down and I'm going to buy a lazy chair, leather chair, a TV. I'm going to sit back. I'm going to take it easy for the next few years. And he looked at God and basically said, I'm going to be lukewarm and just take it easy for the next few years. God said, the father said, you fool. I'm going to demand your life this very night. <whistles> now that was God proving his power. So other idiots, like me, I'll use myself, I don't come along someday if God quadruples everything I have. And I'm like, hey, Lord, thanks for quadrupling everything I have. I'm going to go ahead and take it easy in life now. <laughs> yeah, no. If God quadrupled everything I had, he would require you to become more hotter, more on fire, more prayer, more Bible study, more asking, what do you, you gave me this wealth. What do you want me to do with this wealth, Lord? God never gives one man an incredible amount of money for himself. Every instance in the Bible, the money has been used eventually to bless other people also. That's why he gave great wealth to King David, King Solomon, Abraham. You say, well, Abraham was wealthy. No, Abraham had a lot of employees, a lot of um, family and servants around him. He was blessing all of them. God gave the money to Abraham because he was the trustworthy one. You want to know who runs the churches? These are the best churches to go to. Ask your pastor, are you in charge of the money around here? And the pastor that says, yes, I'm in charge of the money. I'm telling you, it has an effect on his decisions. You ask a pastor, are you in charge of the money? The best pastors I've ever found, they say, I never touch any money. I'm an employee of the church. I get a paycheck. They give me a monthly paycheck. I'm an employee here. 
That way, he's removed from the money part of the church and can preach the word of God openly and freely. The people who run the church are like some kind of like, uh, it's a, a group of men, like some doctors, lawyers, accountants, steadfast men who get together and decide together what to do with the money separate from the pastor. That's the best church to go to when the pastor is, when you go to a lot of these churches and the pastor, you know, is getting like $17,000 a month to preach the word of God. They're not preaching 17,000 times better than I am. And I'm preaching it for free. Now, I'm not complaining. I'm saying they're... I'm, I'm doing it for free like millions of other people are doing for free. The word of God is given to you for free. You're supposed to give it away for free. Now, if you're a pastor, you know, you need to make a, a living and so you can have a family and everything. That's what the church does. But if you're just because pastors do all kinds of other things, too, they don't just preach the word of God. They, they're in charge of a lot of stuff. But they're not in charge of the money. I'm not in charge of you or anything or anybody. I just um, read the words in the Bible for free. But the guy getting, you know, $28,000 a month is not preaching the word of God 28,000 times better than I am. No. You say, well, why is that guy getting that much money? Because he's in charge of the money. You ever see that... Um, I saw an old Western once that they robbed this bank and the one guy, there was two guys and the one guy was so stupid. <laughs> they were passing out the money. So they had all the money and the, the one guy didn't even know how to read or write. You know, this was in the 1800s. He didn't know how to count money and he didn't even know what the value of the bills were. But the other guy knew all those things. He could read or write. He was in charge. You know, he was the mastermind. They robbed this bank. They got like $8,000 or something. So they're sitting there and he hands the guy a bill and says, one for you. Takes one, one for me. Takes another bill and goes, one for you. One, two for me. One for you. One, two, three for me. And the dumb guy says, well, how come, you, are you getting more? And he says, no, um, your bills are more valuable than mine, so this is the way it is. And the guy was so stupid in the Western, he says, oh, that's okay, because all he could see was a big pile of money in front of him. So they got like $8,000, and by the time they were done counting it, the one guy got... The dumb guy got $500, and the guy in charge of the money got $7,500. But both of their piles looked exactly like the same bulkiness, right? When you go to a church, a pastor is a man. He's just a man in the flesh. If his church brings in $7 million this month, now, most churches don't. I'm talking about bigger churches on TV. If you bring in $7 million this month, the pastor's going to be tempted to say, one for you, one for me, one for you, two for me, one for you, three for me, one for you, four for me, you see. We're talking about lukewarmness. I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. Well, what you the only if you ever say it out loud, I am rich, the only thing you should be saying you're rich in is the spirit of God. And there's a catch 22 there. People who are really rich in the spirit, look at the water and the wind just came up. That's wind. The wind just came up 30 miles an hour here. They said it was coming today, so it's here right now. It was like zero, and now it's 35-mile-an-hour wind gusts across this water. 
There's a catch-22. People who are actually rich in the Spirit of God never claim to be rich in the Spirit of God. We just read in the last Bible study, the last church, you did not deny my name, says Jesus. So someone who is actually rich in the Spirit of God, they take no credit. They say all the credit goes to Jesus and no credit goes to me. You need to learn this on earth because in heaven, that's how it's going to be. In heaven, everything's not going to be about you. Everything in heaven is going to be about the glory and power of Jesus Christ. And you will, you think I'm joking, just take my word for it. You will be standing in awe. You will be standing in complete awe all the time, just like, wow. You'll just be looking at the best thing you could ever possibly imagine coming out of Jesus, Jesus Christ, holy, God himself, creator of heaven and earth. How did God get here? We will know. We'll find out in heaven. We'll know everything. I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched. Just look at that word wretched. You are wretched. That's not a word we use today. Wretched means broken. You are pitiful, wretched, broken, filthy, sinful. You're a wretched, sinful. You're just like a filthy object. That's what wretched describes here. But you do not realize you are wretched, pitiful, poor, Blind and naked. You know, it's funny. Go tell a rich man that he's poor. I've seen it done before. I've never done it. I've seen um, preachers t tell rich men that they're poor in the spirit. They get right up in the church, out in the church, stand up and walk out. They say, I don't need this. I got money. I'll go to another church. Goodbye. The pastor wasn't talking specifically to them. He was just saying, whoever, you know, like this example here, you, your riches, you're actually poor without the things of God. And these people identified themselves. They were so offended. They got up in the middle of the church and walked right out. A poor man never walks out of a free buffet. Okay, I'm talking hillbilly talk now. A poor man never walks out of a free buffet without getting something to eat first, putting a couple biscuits in his pocket. Never offer a poor man, you know, a jar full of candy. He'll put his hand in there and take half of it in one swoop. Only rich people complain about free buffets and free pieces of candy. Only rich people say, no, thank you. We're not going to eat your filthy, um, you know, country kitchen buffet. I'm taking my family out to a real restaurant later where they serve real meals because I'm a millionaire. That's what the Bible is saying. And Jesus, and the reason I'm bringing it up like this I want you to picture just how offended a rich person is when the Lord says to them, you claim to be rich, yet you are poor and wretched and pitiful. And these people are like, that's the worst compliment they can, they just work their entire life becoming rich. Never tell a rich person they're a drunkard. Never ever tell a drunk rich person they're an alcoholic or a drunkard. They won't believe you. They say, I'm just drinking. I'm just enjoying the wine that my money bought. Oh, yeah. 
You can always tell a man who used to be low on the streets working for hourly wages. His parents die. They, they leave. Oh, I'll tell you a true story. Just happened last year. I'm not going to say who it is or anything. I know this man. He had his own business. And he was pretty much lazy. He only ran his business four days a week. He never really made a profit. He married a woman about 10 years ago, had a little bit of money. Then he went through all her money. He still had his business. This whole time he was waiting for his dad to pass away. This man never even had enough money most of his life to buy a car. Then his dad passed away at 90 years old. Boom, this guy got $700,000 a single check inheritance. It was all taken care of in advance. $700,000. One week later, the man had a um, an $80,000 camper in front of his house. A month after that, he had a $70,000 truck to pull the camper. Then his wife had a $40,000 brand new car. Now, if you go up and tell this man, you're a fat, lazy, poor man, you would be telling him the truth. He's fat, he's lazy, and he's poor in the spirit. He doesn't believe in the things of God. But he hit the jackpot. The guys, he had to wait till he was almost 70, and then his dad passed away. He hit the jackpot. He hit the jackpot. He got a big, huge, fat check. And what is Jesus saying? You claim to be rich, yet you are poor. Now, what does Jesus say? Now, you think Jesus, you know, if you can lose your, if you're truly saved and you believe you can still lose your salvation, wouldn't Jesus take their salvation away? No. What does Jesus say mercifully? Here comes the mercy and love and kindness of Jesus. I counsel you. All he's going to do is give them some advice on how to become saved. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve, S-A-L-V-E, to put on your eyes so you can see. That's what they did to Paul on the road to Damascus. Saul was blinded and had to be led into a, a prophet in town, so to speak. And he said something like scales fell from my eyes and I could see again when the man laid his hands on me. So Jesus is still giving these rich people. And you notice how Jesus talks to these rich people in a rich language, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. And they're going, what does that mean? If you, Jesus used that um, tech, or term, termology, he's talking to wealthy people saying, I counsel you to buy the kind of gold that can be refined in a fire and still survive, you know, in the death during the, um, during the judgment. And then you, you survive the judgment and then you're refined again in heaven to see what kind of crowns you get. What Jesus is saying, because I actually speak rich man language. I am not a rich man. I've worked for a lot of rich men and I know how to talk to rich people. I'm not I'm not kidding. It's a whole different world. You don't understand. You wake up in an apartment or whatever, these rich people are waking up in a two point six million dollar house. They have an, a garage bigger than your whole apartment just for one one or two of their cars. They think different. They talk different. They believe different because money, there's nothing worse than money to destroy a man. The destruction, if you want to destroy someone, 
give them a lot of money. There's a verse in the Bible that um, Jesus says, if you bless your enemies and give your enemies food and water, it will be like you're, you're heaping burning coals into their lap. It will destroy them. Because we're talking spiritually, you see. You think I want to defeat my enemies. I'm not splitting hairs here. I'm, this, all, every one of these verses are out of the Bible. I want to defeat my enemy, so I need to go over there, you know, and shoot them during battle in a war. Jesus said, that's not how you're going to defeat your enemies. That's how you defeat your own soul to go to hell. If you want to defeat your enemies, go and give them food and water and blessings. And then the Lord will see that you were kind to them. And they are still being mean to you, and the Lord himself will come down and destroy your enemies right before your eyes. That's what we just found out in the, the previous um, Bible study here. That he will make the children of Satan, because you did not deny the name of Jesus Christ, he will make the children of Satan come and bow down before you and acknowledge God's love in your life. Wow. So what are they saying here? He's telling these rich people, you're rich in this world, you're poor, filthy, and wretched in the next world. Go buy yourself gold and silver that can never be taken away. The things of, it, of the Spirit. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So, Jesus says, I rebuke those I love. Okay. So, he must love these people. People say, well, even people who are saved can lose their salvation. I do not agree with that. I've proven it many times over in these books here. If you could lose your salvation, these people would lose it. What is Jesus saying? He's really saying they're not saved at all. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Now remember... Just for now, while the gospel is being preached to every nation up until the end of the tribulation, you can still be saved by turning to Jesus Christ, even during the seven years of tribulation. Now, they will kill you for doing that during the seven years, but you can still be saved. The offer of salvation is still available today. One of the problems people who become saved have is, hey, I'm saved, so um, let's go ahead and start the party now. Nobody else is invited, just me. It's kind of like um, not in my backyard, you know. Well, I bought a house here, so I don't want any homeless shelters nearby now. Well, I bought a house here. I don't want them to put, you know, a manufacturing plant, you know, in the back alley. No, I live here now. That's, unfortunately, that's what a lot of Christians do. They say, okay, I'm here. I'm a believer now. <laughs> okay, you can close the pearly gates. But that's not how God thinks. Jesus loved you when you were still his enemy. You were still the enemy of Jesus. He saved you. He gave you the same warning right before you became saved. He said, if you don't change your ways. Now, I received, I stood up in, um, in public at age 10 and confessed Jesus Christ. So I didn't have a lot of things to change, you know, the first 10 years of my life. 
So Jesus just said, come and follow me. And I said, yes, I will. And the journey began back there. But these are people, some of these people are 70, 80 years old, driving $150,000 sports cars, and they think when they die, they're going to be okay because they did a lot of good things in their life. I myself have told a rich man before. I said, you got a lot of money. And he already told me he didn't believe in Jesus Christ. I said, without Jesus Christ, you're going to spend eternity in hell. And he looked at me and says, you, I was doing some work for him. He said, you really believe that, don't you? I said, I don't just believe it. It doesn't matter what I believe. It matters whether it's true or not. Is it true? You should check into it with all your money. Is heaven and hell real? And when you find out heaven is real, and he said, well, I, he said, I would believe heaven is real. He says, I'm going to have to do some research and find out if hell is real. He said, I got some close friends I can ask that go to churches. So I assume later on, he went and asked his friends, is hell real? And they said, oh yeah, hell's real. And he said, well, how do I um, not go there? How do I prevent myself from going there? Because there's nothing worse. I, I'll tell you this. There's nothing better than a rich man entering the kingdom of God because he served Jesus. The only thing better is someone who was so poor their entire life, they still serve Jesus in all their poverty. And then when a poor person walks into the kingdom of God and they own everything. Wow. Can you imagine? That'd be like winning the lottery times a million times, over and over and over. You win every lottery for the next 5,000 years. That's what it would be like for a poor person on earth who serves Jesus to go into the kingdom of God. But there's nothing more horrible than a rich man entering the um, into hell. Lazarus at the gate and the rich man. The rich man went to hell. There's nothing worse than a man who had everything on earth. And I told that to this man. Said there's nothing worse than someone who has enough money to get anything they want. And it's all stripped away. And you go to hell for all eternity. He said, why would my wealth take me to hell? I said, that has nothing to do with it. Money has nothing to do with it. Your wealth has taken your spirit away from Jesus. That's why you go to hell. You don't have Jesus. Money has nothing to do with it. There's a lot of, be a lot of poor people in hell. And I would say the worst thing ever is if you were poor your whole life on this earth and sick and disease and leper, leprosy or whatever, your whole life, 70 years, and then you deny God or salvation, you, you do not accept. And then you still after suffering this whole world, have to go into hell for all eternity. Because it works both ways. It works both ways. God is the respecter of no man. You can go to hell for being rich and ignoring Jesus, and you can go to hell for being poor and ignoring Jesus. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. There's that word. That's why this um, lesson is pretty harsh, the word discipline. So be earn, earnest and repent. Okay, he didn't say to these people, just repent and believe. No, he said, actually really repent. Don't, be, don't repent lukewarmly. Repent earnestly. Be very earnest. You know, of the tax collector, Levi, when Jesus came to his house, he gave half his possessions to the poor. That was an earnest repentance on Levi's part. That's why Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. He was willing to give half of everything he owned to the poor immediately because 
He believed Jesus was going to give him everything back anyway in heaven. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Awesome. Just as I have, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That is amazing. So there you go. You can be poor and go to hell. You can be rich and go to hell. You can be rich and go to heaven, and you can be poor and go to heaven. The money has nothing to do with it. It all depends on what kind of a Christian you are. Are you an on-fire believing Christian? Or are you a lukewarm, useless Christian? Because you're lukewarm, you're useless. Or are you an ice-cold non-believer? That's what's going to determine whether you go to heaven or hell for all eternity. 